So hi there, today I'm gonna to talk a bit about 3D stress states. The reason we care about this is because pressure vessels force us to care about this. This has always been a thing. I wanna be clear about that. We've always had 3D stress states because last I checked, I live in 3D, so do you, right? There might be some more dimensions we can't see, but what the heck, right? We'll go with, that's what the physicists say. We'll go with 3D, right? We've been dealing with these little stress blocks. A little post-it note does the job just as well, right? And as it so happens, we've always had zero stress in the third direction because we've been looking at the outside edge of things. Well, now when we look at the inner edge of that of that pressure vessel, right? If this is my little chunk of pressure vessel, I've got that pressure, that radial stress pushing in on it. And that's gonna change the game ever so slightly. The other way the game changes is that usually when we have a machine part, let's even just say something like this, getting something like my stylus getting twisted and pulled and bent. The stress in this direction, the actual stress in this direction is usually pretty big. The actual stress in this direction is zero pretty much all the time. There's nothing to cause it, right? I'm not pinching this, so there's nothing to cause that stress. So then I have one stress that's bigger than zero. I have one stress that is zero. And I have a shear stress if I'm twisting it. And I can guarantee you that the two principal stresses in that case, one's going to be positive, one's going to be negative. And as we'll see, that's a huge difference. Okay, that makes a huge, huge thing. So what I've got here is I've got my cylinder pressure vessel, right? Whether I'm looking at the outside or the inside surface, we've got the X, Y, Z set up along the longitudinal hoop and radial direction. So X is longitudinal, Y is hoop, Z is radial. That's a choice. You can put them up however you like. You can call those axes whatever you like. It doesn't matter, okay? I don't see any shear stresses here. That means these are principal, okay? So if I go to plot them on Moore's circle, I'm gonna start with the outside surface, okay? I'm gonna start with the outer. Because it's gonna make a difference. All right, I'm gonna start with the outer here. And it looks to me like my first principal stress is the hoop stress. And of course, I've got tau here in sigma, forgot to label my axes. My second principal stress on the outside is longitudinal. And my third must be sigma r, which happens to be zero. I said we can draw three more circles. Why? We live in 3D. I can rotate about any of the three axes. So let's say I rotate about the z-axis. I'm going to get to the approximation of the fact that I'm trying to draw on a uh, without a compass, right? I'm not going to use a compass on a tablet. Thank you very much, right? This is rotating about the z-axis, this red circle, and it basically will leave the z stress the same. Sigma r on this inner surface will still be sigma r because my thumb is still pointing the same direction no matter what I do with this post-it note as I rotate in the plane, right? So that means that I'm not going to have any change to sigma z, but gosh, sigma l, sigma h are going to change, and they're going to produce some shear stresses too for the different orientations while we're at it. Now, nothing says I can't rotate about the y-axis. That would be the hoop axis. That would be my thumb, right? And what I get is rotations this way, back and forth. But my thumb isn't changing direction, right? So therefore, sigma y stays the same, and my Mohr circle connects sigma r and sigma l, what I called x and z. And of course, I can do the same thing by rotating about the x-axis. And I'll get this third Mohr circle, which connects my original y and z stresses. So if I asked you where the maximum shear stress was on this, I think you'd say pretty quickly, well, it's here, right? There's tau max. Tau max, the maximum shear stress, it's the radius of the largest Mohr circle. Okay, it's the radius of the largest Mohr circle. I'll have an equation for that in a few minutes. But the thing to remember here right? It's the radius of the largest Mohr circle. It doesn't occur in the plane of the skin of the vessel. It occurs 45 degrees in after I rotated about the longitudinal stress axis. 
that's just where it is because that's where I got the largest Mohr circle from, the one that connects the hoop stress to the radial, the hoop stress to zero in this case. Now let's look at the inside surface. Okay, I'm going to look at the inner surface. And almost everything's the same. I only have one little change that turns out to be a relatively big change. Here's sigma, here's tau, same deal. Here's the hoop stress, and if I'm measuring it out exactly correctly, the longitudinal is halfway between the hoop and zero. Fine, right? But now I've got sigma r equal to negative p sitting over here, and that's a ringer. Because sure, I can rotate about the z-axis, and I honestly get exactly the same Mohr circle, right? This is about the z. I can rotate about the x-axis, and I get a slightly different Mohr circle. The Mohr circle up above, I think you'll agree, if I've done it 100% accurately, would look exactly the same size as the one in the, about the z, right? What if I rotate about the x? That's where things start getting a little funky, but here we go. If I rotate about the x-axis, I get this Mohr circle. And again, I think you'd agree. This is where tau max lives. It's again the radius of the largest Mohr circle. In any event, what I can always say about tau max, because it's the radius of the largest Mohr circle, well, if I know the three principal stresses, and I do, sigma h, sigma l, sigma r, sigma l is in the middle, don't care. Right, because it has nothing to do with that biggest Mohr circle sitting in the middle of the Mohr circle. For the one up above for the outer surface, it's at the center. Here, it's off center, slightly to the right of center. Fine, right? I don't care about that. I care about the other two because the diameter of Mohr circle is going to be sigma h minus sigma r. It's going to be the largest principal stress minus the smallest principal stress. I mean, that's just from the geometry of a circle, right? If I want the radius, I divide it by 2. And I don't care whether I'm on the inner surface, outer surface, anywhere in between. That always works. That equation always works. And this is why the largest, the largest shear stress is going to occur at the inner surface. The inner surface... has the larger shear stress. Why is that? Let's use this equation, right? At the in at the outer surface, let's start at the outside. Tau max equals, I've got my equation up here, sigma max. Oh, the biggest principal stress is the hoop stress, sure. Minus sigma min. Well, for the outer surface, that's sigma r. Well, that's zero at the outside. Hey, let's do that. Over 2 equals sigma h over 2. And if you want to get really clever about it, you can say that's the longitudinal stress. And I won't hold that against you. That's a pretty good thing to see. Right? So that's what's happening at the outside surface. What about the inside? Right? Tau max equals sigma max. Hey, that's the hoop stress. Minus... The smallest principal stress, hey, wait a sec, that's sigma r, which is minus p. Uh-oh, I'm subtracting a negative. Minus a negative p over 2, and I get sigma h over 2 plus p over 2. The inner surface has the larger shear stress for that reason. It's got the extra, extra compressive principal stress in the third direction, which forces us to have a larger shear stress because the Mohr circle radius got bigger. Okay? That's where this all comes from. That's why we have to care about 3D stresses. This is leading us to theories of failure, where we're going to take principal stresses and make them do their actual job, right? Because if you're th going through a whole static strength and materials thing, you start off in statics, and you learn how to turn forces, how to turn external forces into internal software reactions, all that stuff. And then you get to a strength of materials or mechanics and materials course, depending on where you, what school you go to. And you say, by the way, that was just step one. 
Step two is to get all these stresses. Oh, well, that's nice. Now we have all these stresses. That's great. And then step three is to find the principal stresses. And then step four is to finally, hey, look, do something with them, right? So we're making baby steps to get to step four, essentially, by knowing what, what the maximum shear stress is. All right. What about a sphere? Here's what a spherical pressure vessel look like, looks like. The only difference is now the X and Y directions have the same axial stress because it's a sphere. It's symmetric in all directions. Really, what do I need to say other than that? I can't have those, those two axial directions have different stresses. Heck, I don't even think I should have shear in that plane. And I don't, and I can show it. It's actually kind of funky, right? So let's draw those more circles. I'll do outer and inner again. But I think you know what the, what the answer is going to turn out to be if you were paying attention to the cylinder part. Sigma, tau. So I'm going to have sigma A over here, which again was PR over 2T, the same as sigma L above, right? And then my other stress in the plane is, well, sigma A. That's funky. I've got two principal stresses living on that same point. And then I've got sigma r down here, which is equal to zero. So what's happened here is that one of my prints, one of my Mohr circles is simply a point, right? I'm going to write it as Mohr circle for the xy plane. is just a point. That's how I know there's no shear stress. Because then I don't matter how I don't care how I rotate this stress block in the surface. I have sigma A here, I have sigma A here, both coming out the sides. I don't care how I rotated it. That's what Mohr circle says too by making that Mohr circle into a point. The other two Mohr circles, I'll draw it in blue. They live on the on top of each other. So right here is tau max. And using the same equation as above, because it looks like it applies, right? Tau max is going to equal just simply, I want to scroll down just a smidgen here. Tau max is going to equal sigma a minus zero over two equals sigma a over 2. Wonderful. PR over 4t. No problemo. What about the inner surface? And again, like I said, if you paid attention to the cylinder, you're thinking, oh gosh, this is going to be ever so slightly different, and it's going to make all the difference. And you're right. It goes here. Again, I have my what some mathematicians would call a degenerate Mohr circle. It's just a point. It's a circle with radius of zero for crying out loud. So therefore, no shear stress. And I've got minus P, which is sigma R. Therefore, what I wind up with is that Mohr circle. If I label my axes tau and sigma as I should, there's tau max. And now using the top of the next page, tau max. Well, that was clever. Every now and again, word does that to me. Tau max is equal to sigma a minus negative p over 2. Again, just sigma max minus sigma min over 2 equals sigma a over 2 plus p over 2. And again, the inside surface sees a larger shear stress than the outside surface. And again, it's pointed 45 degrees in. I keep saying 45 degrees in. Why am I saying 45 degrees in? Because I know more circle, right? More circle, the angle on the circle is twice the angle in reality. The angle from the principal stress directions, if I put my X at sigma A and my Y at, at sigma R, let's say, whatever, it doesn't matter what letters they are, I gotta rotate 90 degrees to get that thing vertical to get to the maximum shear stress. That means I'm 45 degrees away in reality, right? So. That's a bit about how 3D stress states work, and that's why the maximum shear stress in a pressure vessel was at the inner surface and not the outer. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of it.